Hello everyone, today we talk about the 9th century Assyrian war chariot for our series on Bronze Age warfare historical units. Um, and this chronological segmentation is quite important because, as you know, at the turn between the 2nd and the 1st millennium BC, chariot warfare that had been dominant in, during the Bronze Age is starting to be gradually let's say, resized because of the rise, especially of infantries, uh, that mm, really made it more difficult for uh, war chariots to simply dominate the battlefields, but also horsemanship, right? So actual cavalry that was starting to side the charioteers and becoming gradually more, uh, more effective. It's as if cavalry was being born essentially at this point as an arm proper because one thing is riding a horse and I made a video about the origins uh, of that right and another thing is having an effective arm on the battlefield that you can start to appreciate historically um, together with the others. Um, so today's video really sticks to the technicalities of the 9th century Assyrian war chariot um, yet it, it observes fundamentally and we don't have terms of comparison today, but that's also why I make the various um, historical unit videos um, separately. Um, it shows like how fundamentally from previous times and looking at what warfare also became later, what characteristics right, were essentially taking form at this point in order to fit in this, in this broader chronology. In other words, why did the... 9th century Assyrian war chariot function the way it did and not in the way in the previous centuries. Also, other, there are differences with other peoples, that those are significant, but there is a general trend that, as you can understand, it may be actually counterintuitive, but I say war chariots became more um, impacting, paradoxically, because that's what they could uh, achieve. Uh, while there were other forces, first of all, they were toughened, right, especially on foot, that had to receive their charge, but also because their mobility was being gradually outmatched by horsemen. And thus, what you see at, at the end of chariot warfare, especially in this very area, think about the Seleucid army, um, etc., um, you have massive chariots that uh, are, were quite um, different from the uh, very agile ones of the Bronze Age that had to carry out a sort of caracal uh, tactic before smashing to, uh, into the enemy, right? Softening uh, preemptively the, the enemy lines with, with missile. Um, and the, the best way to employ them at that point was just instead to smash through whatever was literally in front of them. Um, naturally, there were ways to cope with these charges too, and um, Chariot warfare has a logic on its own that we can't quite uh, explain now, especially for those points. But there is um, a video made on Bronze Age warfare as a broader introduction, and we will come back prepotently uh, with that at some other point, because this series, as you understand it, is very thorough, perhaps even more than the ones in the Middle Ages as far as the detail goes. Uh, let's not exceed, but in terms of especially. Of, of sources availability there is paradoxically more than that I'm going to make here than than in other in other series it we also updated it less frequently not to annoy you excessively with Bronze Age warfare after all I'm just a humble medievalist but let's just go with that um, an important fact to appreciate here is that the Assyrian chariot design was developing particularly fast at this point at least for the speed that you could um, measure in the previous in, in the previous centuries, right? The world is accelerating in terms of the art of war and civilization, broadly speaking. And in the case of the Assyrians, in particular, because of the influences coming from the Iranian and Transcaucasian military cultures. I made a video specifically on the Transcaucasus, uh, and uh, in this time, and the fact that 
uh, of course, had a, an important impact beyond the, re the regional era for, for a number of reasons. Um, we didn't talk about Iran at the same time, but essentially what we see increasingly uh, in Mesopotamia is the infiltration of, uh, in fact, steppes, peoples, and single horsemen sometimes that were also settled by the, uh, I don't know, by the Rartrans, but by these various groups that are sometimes even difficult to, to track as far as the demographic um, dynamics, the, the settlement, especially the, in, in a world that was much less regulated in spite of these powerful empires, in, in spite of Assyrian warfare that was essentially the most advanced that the world had ever seen up to this point. It really began, as we've seen also recently in, in that video about why Rome and Israel never had such a thing like um, an oplitic phase in their warfare, to field this orderly um, trained battle lines that were able really to, to counter it themselves like the, the char chariotry of course every um every people every every unit even that we're seeing like today um has to be evaluated mostly within the the military culture of the same people that produces it rather than simply the enemies right because actually the, the major influence always comes from the within right of politics and society rather than the enemies that they they were actually meeting right and there is not a a traumatic difference between um, uh, military cultures at this point at least compared to other times in uh, later say uh, divide and civilizational development yet of course in relative terms these changes are important we can appreciate them from the same Assyrian chair uh, war chair design for the 9th century we have uh, an important amount of Assyrian art that you can admire in the pictures I uploaded here, um, which in fact the cab, uh, the cabin of, of the chariot is depicted in great detail as we'll see now together with the rest of, of, of the structure. It's um, essentially, as you see from the pictures, a simple box that is uh, now slightly be below hip height um, the sides of which arrive slightly below the hip right in in height and sloping gently down from the rounded upper rear corners uh, to the front as we will see now this is a first indicator of the fact that essentially the 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 cap was slightly um, shorter in the front in order to facilitate the impact right the transmission of the force through the the pole connected to the horses um, at impact and as we will see now how um, the same cabin was stabilized for, for that purpose but increasingly towards that, that direction. So we're not looking at, you know, that fundamentally at this point already the um, the, the wheels are mm, essentially backwards in, in their, um, their, their uh, axle is uh, fixed in the rear part of the same cabin uh, exactly to shift the bar center ahead. Um, and this, this was importantly different from the, the earliest uh, developments um, as far as the, the the increasing impact mechanic in chariotry tactics had been developing. Um, we see that albeit the framework of the cabin is not really represented uh, iconographically because they uh, they show basically always from the side and these were uh, in the internal part, as they were covered, as we will see now, uh, we can um, assume, right, by analogy, by the way, with earlier Egyptian chariots that we physically have, right, and, and I made a video um, about that, uh, if I'm not wrong for, say, New Kingdom, that a single pole of wood was heat bent 
through steaming, by the way, to take roughly the shape of a C to form the very lower frame for the chariot floor, right? It was a robust mm, pole, right, curve, just to uh, have this frontally, uh, in fact, uh, curved uh, face of the of, of of the chariot and ending up essentially at the at the wheels, um, the open ends of of the C, so in the rear, were joined by a securely fastened thick strong pole, while the actual floor of the cabin was made from leather thongs uh, passed through essentially s s through slots cut in the lower frame and interwoven to provide this um, flexible, strong, and bending, and easily and gracefully moving uh, platform, which uh, had, importantly enough, to absorb the bumps and, and jolts um, of, the, of the drive, uh, that, this is important, didn't have actually springs. Um, Otherwise, and so th this um, this we will see the were systems, of course, to absorb further the, the entire structure was designed in order to provide the best sort of comfort for for the crew, but um, it was also a hell of a ride. It, it required specific athletic capacities to um, uh, to fight uh, on on board independently from the the actual role. This is something we will see better in the videos dedicated to the to the crews, because uh, today we just look at the chariot itself and at best at the weapons that could be lodged in it for naturally use in combat, but not only. Um, so when you look at the floor of of the cabin, you could have you could see right a, a woven rug, uh, sort of carpet, right that was quite typical of. Near Eastern chariots, also the tassels of of these very rags um, that are shown behind the wheels of Assyrian chariots in art. So the upper rail of the cabin was made basically in the same way um, the the lower one was. Uh, so from a heat bent pole, albeit it was essentially placed horizontally, hand to sustain the the sides, and so it ended joining uh, to the rear of the lower frame, right, so uh, like a C, right, um, essentially with the uh, extremes horizontal to the to the floor of the chariot. Uh, it was secured at the front by one or more straight wooden suspensions of sort, um, which thus uh, well, was some kind of, of spring, but not to a dramatic degree. Um, so when you look at, at, the, at the cabin's frame, you sometimes have difficulties from art to, to, to understand what it was covered like, but it, this was probably ox hide, right? It was stitched and um, lashed around the upper rail, lower frame. It was not, of course, the best form of protection. As we will see now, there was even a shield in the rear of the cabin, so the most vulnerable one. But it is true that aside from the fact that in front of you you had the horses and so that if some uh, hit arrived to them, it was a bigger problem for, for the entire crew. Um, the, uh, say, the agility of, of the chariot depended on the fact that the, um, the the structure had to be fundamentally empty and just covered by these layers, in the case of the floor, just for just having the crew operating the chariot and all around, offering this minimal protection. That If you count, however, the fact that rarely hits are going to arrive, at a 90, perfect 90 degree uh, angle, and especially during the type of tactics that these um, chariots performed, everything happened right during these fights. But 
generally, right? Uh, it's not the chariot alone, it's, it's the formation and such, so that's something you shouldn't be worrying too much about if you have a collective discipline, after all, how heavily armored um, you are, at least if you are, of course, making a compromise with agility, with maneuverability in general. Um, it seems evident that this construction we just outlined was in fact intended to produce firstly a light and yes of course also strong cabin but fundamentally making things as light as possible because of course the crew was also considerably heavy uh, and the horses couldn't be too tired in the first place. Um, when you look at the floor frame joints uh, you can see them tightly closed by the same weight of the crew right on the interwoven thong floor the upper rail was made more resilient by using a few as few joints as possible by heat bending the extremes of the lower frame were likely uh, protected by some mm, calcium carbonate or bronze knobs, so some sort of rounded lumps or bowls, right, and that were at the end, in fact, of the, of the frame, uh, which is what we see also in earlier Egyptian chariots, by the way. This was a sort of mm, already archaic mean, after all, uh, by the 8th century when um, this type seemed to have ceased to be in use as essentially the, the cabin was becoming square as opposed to um, uh, say wider than deeper as it had been historically in chariot warfare for the same reason that as you understand the, the chariot must to be ever more smashing rather than just a platform uh, with which to go around um, and Considering at least uh, the evidence from later Cypriot chariots that we'll talk about at some point, the aforementioned knobs had become obsolete and substituted by a decorated oval disc uh, secured with a bronze finial in the same position, by the way. Um, it is possible that, as we have seen for the later Cypriot chariotry that were really similar just in construction. I mean, the, the essence of chariots doesn't quite change uh, at least from you know, century to century, but there are significant um, differences as we are highlighting them uh, now. The, in fact, 9th century Assyrian war chariots had um, a partition upright, essentially splitting the cap down the center. There was a tall circular band of metal uh, situated behind the latter and above the axle. Um, so this partition essentially was designed to provide with internal support uh, to the crew uh, during the fast turns or leaning of, of the chariot um, if uh, you know of course there the var were various circumstances in which the crew itself was exhausted so it was important to provide them any kind of uh, stability possible in those emergential, emergential situation and, and the loop would have also aided uh, the crew to enter the cabin, right? It uh, functioned as well as the support for the round spiked shields was located, as shown in, in Assyrian art, in the rear of the cabin, in the open part, so that uh, if they had turned tail or somebody was just uh, behind them, they would have not been... Uh, been hit and this is interesting because it shows how they couldn't quite even simply abandon the chariot it, it would have been also 
relatively dangerous, uh, at least in earlier times, it was somehow more common to simply mount and dismount the, the chariot, especially as Bronze Age heroic warfare was concerned. At this point, chariots become really for the crews, uh, and albeit, of course, these did use with incredible athleticism to, to jump out um, and, and in uh, during during melee combat. This was not, let's say, much more just the, the, the objective anymore. It was, of course, especially in these areas where, um, say, chariot warfare is very, very developed also because there is a lot of chariots operating at the same time. That's, that's not the aim, right? In more tribal contexts where in which again um heroic warfare was more out there were also less there were less chariots uh these were also we've seen it in archaic roman warfare for example just rarer compared to infantry in in relative terms uh numerically and so at that point it was much more likely for the warrior to dismount at a point but it was not even there we've seen it in celtic warfare etc the, the primary objective, of course, if you had uh, war chariots, the, the main purpose, as for any unit, was to use them collectively. Um, the Assyrian war chariot probably had also only a partial divide uh, f uh, in, in the, in the cabin for the third crewman who is depicted, in fact, in Assyrian art as often riding behind the other two um, and always, always shown as grasping a leather loop knotted exactly in the place of junction of what we'll describe now as the drought pole that was quite functional here, of course, for the stability of the chariots, absorbing the, the impact also Kind of, uh, even through the horses with wall structure. Um, and that, however, was particularly um, robust, exactly, for that reason. Supporting the upper rail, as we've seen, at the cab front, right? So this, we, without this handhold, it would have been difficult for this third crewman to even move, right? Um, and not just to be unbal dangerously unbalanced. Talking size, approximately an Assyrian war chariot cabin had to be 80 centimeters height in the front, 90 in the rear, with a depth of uh, the, the structure from front to back of 60 centimeters, roughly. So you realize how this thing is heading compared to the previous models towards really a, a, a squared um, form. Um, one of the most interesting innovations, however, that we see in, in Assyrian war territory is the um, subframe and drought pole. Um, this is important because before, in the Near East, this type of um, structure had not existed, right? And it has evidently to do with the increased need for smashing power during the charges. Uh, we are very lucky to get again this um, this highly decorated bas relief about uh, the chariots, for example, of Ashur Nasser, Paul II. We are between the 80s and the 50s of the 19th century BC. Um, before that time, we mostly have to rely on the Egyptian examples uh, that had a simple subframe with essentially a single hit bent road pole that was in between the rear mounted axle, so where uh, the uh, the wheel was, as we've seen at, at the um, at the rear end of the same uh, cabin, and the two grooved mountings that connected the axle with the sides of the lower frame, right? So basically you had a the drought pole uh, that had to support the entire 
pool of, 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 of the chairs, etc., running beneath the center of the cabin uh, lower level and being fastened through leather thongs to the front of, of the same before, however, curving upwards which supported the yoke, right? So it's something that really didn't have any other complicated, um, say, multiple parts. It was just this pole making the entire work. The Assyrians, as we can appreciate again from Asher Nasserpel's reliefs, started to do it differently. There are actually two chariots depicting sort of the older draw pole system but all the others which statistically are quite relevant uh, in this rich representations clearly depict the draw pole passing across the lower front of the cab to a ribbed element that is located on a sort of wedge shaped uh, spar passing at the level of the lower, uh, say, of the, the floor of the cabin, um, so back behind the wheel to the axle. There are also other chariots in substantial quantity provided with a second curved shaft that runs below the drove pole and that joins uh, a similarly ribbed part of and 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 the spar underneath and sometimes even overlapping with the first one. Um so the details here are somehow difficult to represent if you look at the uh at the pictures you may get an idea, right? Um they are detailed enough if you look them um to show essentially that there were two drought poles, right? That there is no such thing like the heat band longer one going underneath the cabin's uh, floor frame, but these are actually socketed into two separate spars that are located on both sides of the cabin and when you look at the rib, you realize that this was a sort of metal clasp that secured the socketed joint that was vital for the entire stability of the thing because it, if it opened right literally you would have the horses running uh it's a, at, at least it would um um uh, it would create a, a dramatic friction it would, it would break essentially the the, the uh, remaining pole and everything would have collapsed right um the interesting aspect is also that these poles converged at a brief distance in front of the cabin to eventually run together up to the yoke, right? So it's a sort of Y-shaped uh, structure for the same, so the two poles uniting. And it probably derived from the Transcaucasian two-wheeled carts displaying a uh, sort of A-shaped frame um, which may have in turn been derived from the 10th century Iranian chariots. Now the reason why this uh, essentially uh, drought pole reinforcement came around from those regions is the fact that of course their terrain was much bumpier to say the least some of it is really mountainous, there are a few plains, um, and there is at the same time more cavalry that requires chariots to be more compact. Um, to some degree, um, you can argue that, in, at least in relative terms, infantry had a greater importance, uh, especially in the Caucasus, than it had in Mesopotamia. Right, but mostly it's about the overall increase of the chariot stability again uh, against the uh, the odds, whichever they were. Primarily, of course, the enemies, in a way. But um, 
the uh, the terrain as well right it had to be more resistant um, and withstanding greater impact right and this has to do definitely even in Mesopotamia with the strengthening of infantry so it's not merely an imitation from peoples that after all were just at the outskirts of the more powerful empire that Assyria represented right and we have observed uh, some of this also in the video about the Neil uh, Ittite army organization by the way um, we do not know even exactly when this drought system was adopted by the Assyrians because in the 9th century we see it already m mature in, in the local art and so we presume that of course it was not a novelty right and that uh, actually at this point it had become the standard so there are actually gradual changes but still significant ones for um, a military t technology that was fundamentally quite um, say leveled quite um, compactly responding to very practical needs so this does show a sort of shift in the relation of the various arms in a broader sense, which this is just a consequence of. Um, Ashur Nasser Paul II fought in the north of Assyria early on in his reign. Um, it's, um, it's possible that at that point he had um, in needed to improve the robustness of his chariots uh, on tougher ground against tougher uh, infantries uh, and that he wanted expressly to celebrate this technological accomplishment um, by instructing his own artists to, to represent the very details of which he was um, so taped of the chariots of which he was so proud because of his uh, military deeds right um, there is some uncertainty in spite of the overall level of accuracy in the way these two drought poles um, are represented by the artists which may have had to do of course with the fact that these guys were not necessarily um, experts in the way this chariots uh, looked like and or maybe they were confused still with the earlier models and or they uh, th there was some lack of interest maybe for the same detail overall but right um, we appreciate still this magnificent uh, iconography to derive this this uh, this information and after all is telling us something very coherent regarding to the the art of war in Mesopotamia uh, at the time and it corresponds to the broader trend of waning of the of the war chariot so you have a much stronger sub frame right um, a more secure cabin overall and and after all for not much of a weight increase uh, correspondingly right which makes you reflect on, on the fact that this was uh, a doctrinal say a, a positive uh, a willing doctrinal change um, in times in which let's say the the essentials of warfare were, were changing fairly fast and so what you needed was probably redrawing the, the say the, the chariot mechanics for another purpose rather than simply um, uh, implementing on one side um, of its of its change um, because it, it's a substantial structural difference the drought pole spars for example take the place of the earlier mountings at this point that stood between the floor uh, frame and the axle which means that it would have supported the lower frame for a greater part of its extension then you would have had a longitudinal beam between the spars and essentially under uh, actually over the front of the cabin which instead supported more than the earlier type um, 
as we've seen, was just a single um, draw pole. Um, this reinforced remarkably uh, the entire structure. Um, in fact, first of all, it just gave more stability to the to the cabin, right? It would, for example, resent less of the lateral uh, forces during turns, which uh, would confer general stability to the entire to the entire chair. It would make it um, even perform more, you know. Uh, say it was not much about an increased agility as we've seen but say if you are using the chariot in an ever more smashing fashion and you have to suddenly turn rather than doing something more gentle and with a more flexible structure you want to count more on that side to say maintain the 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 cabin steadier Right, it would have been overall more rigid, actually. Right, that's the point. Having greater resistance, also just to impact, right, and to accidents as they happen regularly. Consider that on campaign, these chariots were not employed just into the face-to-face -face, uh, smashes, which were already a big deal. But there could have been again on, say, broken terrain, different challenges to meet with, and this all overall. Uh, reinforcement helped uh, coping partly with that. The squaring of the cabin occurred likely in the same during the same ninth century towards the end. Um, it may have derived, in fact, from say rather than a, a doctrinal choice, but by the same technical uh, consequences that this changes in the subframe entailed just to make the structure more functional. Um, in case of need, right, it could be economical um, but also one of, of space, you could essentially take away the floor frame, right, you could bass the cabin and floor directly on the on the subframe underneath. It was rectangular um, and it was, as we've seen, made by the, the two draw pole spars um, at the extreme. So um, this had some other practical implication. Plus, we see metal clasps at the, the joint with the subframe. So what? What you see is also the, the WIPO um, depicted to be sustained at two other points in addition to that already. And in the point in which the growth poles met, because they were like the Y eventually becoming one, um, that was one point. The other was at the end of the combined poles itself. Um, so we can think that um, there was a sort of leather tongs uh, pole braces, right, keeping this together. It's it's fundamentally clear from the iconography, and, and this would naturally. Uh, strengthen and the joint between the same pole and the cabin so that the wooden struts that were placed as a sort of V uh, when at least you would look at them from the above because they also had this uh, joint um, which conferred further by the way su support to the front of the cabin and so all this structure helped to absorb better impact, right? Mostly from a frontal point of view. So distributing the force through more joints and um, channels, we can say. And 
allowing this also to uh, distribute itself better on the sides right so we're so reinforced for this uh, reason the pictures are clear enough you have a sort of curved rod that um, makes this jump like um, between say the horse and the um, and, and the cab and it's sustained by this other two elements uh, from the above that join with above with the cab right it, it's really simple as a concept and it is meant to provide um, this greater stability of the entire system and to absorb better the uh, the shocks the force interestingly enough you have as far as the second growth pole brace is concerned the connection uh, to the yoke above the horse to the to the upper part of, of the cab um, and uh, as you see in the pictures it takes on this form of an elliptical uh, shape at least um, with the serrated uh, upper um, edge right at the extremes um, and we do not know exactly what it represents right especially along the edge you see uh, some um, some little holes. So this may have been structured like with, with a sort of metal rings or loops that of uh, of likely leather, right? This was something fairly flexible, um, designed just to, of course, to fasten the structure, but also to decorate um, through this, um, let's say, this el elliptical cloak right over a wooden the wooden pole um, this uh, pole by the way curved upwards from the upper edge of the cabin before essentially going down to join the growth pole near the, the yoke as we've seen um, and it could have some broader uh, stabilizing function of course overall but it could also be a decorative element in the cloth um, that uh, constituted the, the part uh, in, in in between that uh, could help identify we see there are different m motives little flowers things like that this was knotted to the top of the cabin and growth pole support um, the other two again the the yoke peg of, of the horse um, and we do find actually some similar uh, element in uh, some early contemporary Neo-Ithite slabs, um, stones, um, with the same, in fact, upper pole. Uh, we see it even in Missanan frescoes. So it was something relatively um, fashionable, common, and part of this design that had come to um, to prevail so because Assyria dictated most essentially of the military uh, changes and techni say technical innovations in the Mediterranean aside as we've seen from actually some elements that kept pouring from at least the direction of the steps um, we do find also not elliptical but triangular clothes appearing which may be that uh, there was no pole from which this hung but rather um, um, stretched pull tight thong um, reinforcing the same pole end um, so that it would stem from there as opposed from from the pole the former type can be found, in fact, as early as the 12th century in the same Assyrian chariots, in the ones of the uh, geometric Hellenic uh, vases, and even in some Neo-Hittite reliefs. Uh, in other words, the tongue and pole braces functioned um, in a similar way uh, to the in fact, it was this narrow strip of leather or, uh, or, or struts right between the cabin and the drawed pole mechanism that we explained before with the the possibility of a solid pole variety preventing the drawed one from uh, moving 
uh, upwards and uh, placing in fact too much strain on the joints um, between the, the, the road poles parts as well so everything was calibrated really to offer the, the minimum uh, of course uh, stress to the to a single point and just distributing it as uh, effectively as possible uh, perhaps the best type of chariot uh, we are exemplifying today is the one from the reliefs of Ashur Nasser Paul II at Nimrud also the beautiful bronze gates of Balavat that date to the time of Shalmanazar III are quite more say they're li less detailed because there's the figures are smaller but they give you an idea of also together with other troops how these chariots um, operate in fact they are shown as being drawn by uh, either two or three horses now this is interesting because um, some have suggested that uh, there were actually just two horses conceived right for these type of chariots and that the third one would be a sort of replacement that was simply harnessed to one side uh, of of the theme and which is perhaps unlikely because first of all what happened if this horse got downed right it would essentially uh, drag the entire vehicle the all the horses the crew uh, down with him right especially in combat where they were running uh, pretty fast right it would have destroyed essentially the entire um, vehicle by the way and catapulting the crew in injuring the horses so this doesn't seem like very um, realistic part of the way these chariots were designed uh, entailed of course the of course the the awareness that if one horse say what was taken down it, it was uh, quite of a problem during the run but at least there was a sort of symmetry that had to uh, provide with sort of um, lack of any sort of uh, problem aside from the frontal direction that as we've seen essentially chariots are ever more designed towards right the same by the way point could be made against the idea that that horse was a sort of single spare one um, that would uh, just run along uh, with the others but that's likely not how these horses operated um, in uh, at least the say cavalrymen were operating in supportive roles but not necessarily the, the lined up ones that we see here it's shown by some Iranian but also other sources however there were three horse chariots so uh, at this point the four ones seem to have been just the ultra elite right very heavy things and less maneuverable than the others but also more powerful um, so the, it, it was possible to adapt uh, the two horse chariots to take four horses by essentially attaching the horses to the relative upturned ends of, of the yoke and only the inner horses at that point would have wooden yoke saddles right better of course connected to the entire system we've seen today um, and you realize that as such the outer horses were not really pulling right this seemed at best a more stable solution than the three horses so in an asymmetric fashion however later there would be improvements that would uh, afford like the all four the horses to equally pull by the way which as long as the thing remains symmetrical so the difference between the outer and inner ones was not this huge deal but still you could increase of course the uh, the pull dramatically they're doubling it literally um, 
there were mm, brass bands for the horses, also some backing element by the way. Of course the chariot were loaded in weapons that could be wielded by um, the crew. So we can think about the you know the full panoply there. Bow, uh, quiver, um, axes, spears, darts of every kind. Um, you see crossed, uh, two cross quivers attached at time to the sides of, of the cap. Remember that chariot warfare was still about a lot of missile warfare as well, right? And uh, the spear could be held in a separate holder. Um, you could see even standards, of course, um, carried in the chariot. One interesting aspect about the standards is they had uh, a disc shape um, and bore the image of the essentially the national god of the ancient Assyrians, uh, Ashur, right? Um, which would remain, in fact, the same until the gradual conversion to Christianity uh, until the 5th century AD. Were also other religious devices, different uh, deities, of course, in the hierarchy of, uh, of these warriors that at some point did believe to really descend from, from gods in a relatively uh, close past, right? Um, so there is all an interesting picture there. But the, the disc there is also the key a bit to the fact that um, this shape was the symbol of Ashur in the Assyrian times. Some say that it could represent Shamash instead, but we see this also inherited in the Achaemenid uh, symbology later on, and uh, so also the, the shape here of the standard is not really random. Uh, the the shape was again oval with wings, right? And that is obviously the the imperial symbology, of divine vi glory, victory, descending from heaven. Um, the horses themselves, can I say that they were decorated with some kind of padded armor, right? Would be somehow typical. Also, for, for example, for the monarch's chariot, um, there were heavier form of armor, um, with uh, and also just the design could be different. For example, there were lamellar trappers, um, and generally speaking, we will talk about horse armor in, in another video as far as the Syrians go. Cause this is mostly about the chariot, and things are somehow more complex, and even they are evolving over time, so they're interesting to track uh, accordingly. Uh, for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.